So then he goes into this, um, so he's, he's constantly arguing and arguing against the counter arguments, right? Um, and so um, th in, the, in the next section, he talks about uh, the difference between actions and visions, right? Um, and so um, he says, but where God teaches the prophet and in compliance with the custom of that time con condescends to the same mode of instruction, then the signific significative action is generally changed into a vision either natural or extraordinary. So, so he's saying that when, when, when God is, is teaching the people, um, there's this, the prophet uses actions to teach the people. But when God is just teaching the prophet as an individual person, then God uses a vision instead, right? You know, kind of like, you know, like a, a vision or a dream or something like that that, that the prophet sees. Um, as where the prophet Jeremiah is bid to regard the rod of the almond tree and the seething pot, the work on the powder's wheel and the basket of good and bad figs, and the prophet Ezekiel, the resurrection of the dry bones. So these are examples of these visions that di the different pro uh, prophets um, saw. The significative action was, I say in this case, generally changed into a vision, but not always. So he's saying that sometimes you have these visions that are just kind of these, you know, these visions of the prophets, but, but not always. Sometimes there are these actions that the prophets carry out in sight of the people in order to instruct the people. So there's these two types of images um, that, he's, that he's laying out for us, uh, the actions and the visions. Now what's important, the reason that he's laying out this difference is that there's another writer, Maimonides, um, who wants to read all of these types of figures of speech in the Bible as visions and he doesn't want to recognize um, the validity of these actions as modes of instruction for the people, right? So he says that the excellent Maimonides, um, not attending to this primitive mode of information, this mode of information we call is, is sort of metaphoric images, right, figures of speech, is much scandalized at several of these actions, unbecoming, as he supposed, the dignity of the prophetic office, and is therefore, in general, for resolving them into supernatural visions impressed upon the imagination of the prophet. Um, so, you know, so he's, he's arguing, that, or he's, he's here describing how Maimonides says that all of these actions as images for the people uh, is saying, no, they're just, they're, they're, they're just visions. Um, and this because two or three of them may perhaps admit such interpretation. He says, you know, some of them might be like that, but only two or three, in which he is followed by Christian writers, much to the discredit, as I conceive, of religion. So there's these other, Maimonides was Jewish. Christian writers also follow this line of argumentation, and, 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 and Warburton said this is, this is a, a discredit to religion and, to, and it's, a, it's, it's a, to the triumph of libertinism and infidelity. So this is, these are, this is a bad interpretation according to Warburton. The actions of the prophets being delivered as realities, um, not as metaphors, and these writers representing such actions as absurd and fanatical. Right, so he's so, so again. I, he's 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 you know this this kind of refers a little bit back to Hobbes. You remember one of the complaints that Hobbes had about metaphors is that they're absurd. Right, the, the inblown virtue, the the round quadrangle, these are absurd. We can't use these types of of phrases. Um, and um, and what Warburton is suggesting, well, this is what Maimonides is saying that these are um, you know absurd and fanatical, um, but. It's because they're taking them as realities rather than figures of speech, right? And so, um, in in laying out this this um, Maimonides and by extension Hobbes' sort of disapproval of such figures of speech, Warburton then, then introduces his own interpretation, uh, which tries to emphasize how they're actually legitimate, right? Because he's he wants to treat these metaphors as legitimate modes of information and of conversation. So. Um, Information by action, and this, and again, you know, he, he lays it out in a really very organized way. Claim, reason, evidence, warrant, right? He's got information by action uh, was at this time and place a very familiar mode of conversation. Um, so he says that it's not, you know, what, what's going on in the, through using these figures of speech is not something absurd and fanatical, but it's actually some, a, a very familiar mode of conversation at that time and place, right? This once seen, all charge of absurdity and suspicion of fanaticism vanish of themselves, right? So it's, of course they're not absurd and fanatical. These were just normal ways that people spoke using these figures of speech. Um, and then he's, he said, this is the reason. He says, the absurdity of an action consists in its being extravagant and insignificant, but use and application made these in question both sober and pertinent. So, so the fact that we use a particular f figure of speech over and over, it makes them 
not absurd, it makes them sober and pertinent. And the fanaticism of an action in the delighting of in unusual actions in foreign modes of speech, but those in question were idiomatic and familiar. And so he's saying, you know, uh, Maimonides calls these sort of images um, fanatical uh, because they're, they're strange and foreign, right? Um, but he says, no, they weren't, in fact, uh, strange and foreign, they were idiomatic. They were, they were what, what th the way people spoke, and it was, it was familiar to them, right? And then he's got the evidence, right? He says, to illustrate this last observation by a domestic instance, um, he says, when the sacred writers talk of being born after the spirit, and he's got these list of, this list of figures of speech, born after the spirit, being fed with the sincere milk of the word, putting their tears in a bottle, bearing testimony against lying vanities, taking the veil from men's hearts, building up one another. All of these are metaphoric uses of language, right? You know, uh, uh, taking the veil from men's hearts. You know, men's hearts don't have veils, obviously, but it's a figure of speech, right? You're, you're taking the veil from their heart, right? Um, and he says that <coughs> the sacred writers talk of this, and they speak the common yet proper and pertinent phraseology of their country, that, that they're basically just using a way of speaking that's, that, that everybody is used to in the place that they speak and not the least imputation of fanaticism can stick upon these original expressions, right? But when we see our own countrymen, so and then he says, well, okay, well, if you take, if we were to do this, and we, we, we see our own countrymen, you know, the English, right, not, not uh, I guess, the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the people in Israel, right, for instance, right? When we see our own countrymen repro reprobate their native language, that is to say, um, reject their native language, and affect to employ only scripture phrases in their whole conversation as if some inherent sanctity resided in the Eastern modes of expression, we cannot choose but suspect such men far gone in the delusions of a heated imagination. So he says, if, if the people in the Bible were speaking this way, this was just a normal way of speaking. If we were to speak this way, we would be deluding ourselves in, in this sort of heated imagination because people don't normally speak this way amongst us, right? And so um, this, is, this is an argument for how these images and metaphors, they're also very specific to a culture, right? He's saying that um, they can be used in a, in a kind of very normal prosaic way, in a sense, in the place where people use those metaphors all the time. But if you transport them into another place where people aren't used to those metaphors, then it is a little bit strange, right? And so that he's saying that this figurative use of language is also something that's very culturally specific that, that belongs to a specific tradition. And, and, and this, you know, this goes to this, this idea of revelation again. Because what he's saying, you know, it, revelation means that um, we, we, we learn something because God has given to it to us that it's, that's a specific thing that we couldn't arrive at uh, by ourselves, just through, through reasoning. And again, these figures of speech, their meaning is something that we can't arrive at through reasoning. We have to arrive at through, you know, it's, it's figurative and it also has to do with kind of the traditions of language that, that people have, um, have, have gathered over time and that, that we, we need to get used to um, as we're learning them. So, so that's, you know, that's the way I'm, I'm reading the claim, reason, evidence, and warrant here, right? That the claim is um, that um, language, um, um, this type of language of figures is a familiar mode of conversation. It's a normal way of speaking. The reason is because they become familiar, right? Or that they're, 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 they're not used in a, in a way that's, um, that's surprising to people. They're familiar with it. There's these examples of how this happens. And then the reason, the, the warrant that he gives is that there's a kind of cultural specificity to the use of these, uh, of these images.